Unlike another Unix-like OS, FreeBSD has roots all the way back to the creation of Unix itself. Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie, along with Rod Kennedy, created their own OS which was to become Unix on a DEC PDP-7 at Bell Labs. Fast forward to 1992 and Lynn and William Jollitz both worked to port the 4.3 BSD to the Intel 80386 at the University of California. NetBSD branched off this in 1993, as did FreeBSD a little bit later. NetBSD and FreeBSD, although no longer containing any code directly connected with the original BSD release, are regarded as being true descendants of the original BSD. FreeBSD is a complete operating system, which, again, unlike other Unix-like OSs, contains not just the kernel, but the tools, userland, and even the documentation. Currently, there are over 33,000 packages available that are created and distributed by hundreds of FreeBSD developers and thousands of FreeBSD contributors. Because FreeBSD is used by some of the biggest companies in the world, there is a good chance that you've used it without even knowing. A lot of people will tell you that FreeBSD is a fantastic server OS only, but I will tell you that FreeBSD is a fantastic server OS and a fantastic desktop OS. In fact, I've been using it for such for the past 13 years as a desktop and server, and on this channel advocating it as such for nearly four years. Using a browser of your choice, in this case Firefox, open up your favorite search engine and type FreeBSD. If you are using Google, you will see the results as you do on the screen. You will see the main link to the FreeBSD site with subsections underneath. If you want to go straight to the download section, then you can. We will in this instance go to the main front page of the FreeBSD site just so you can be familiar with its layout. In the middle of the screen, you will see a big yellow box. That's where you click to go to the download section to either 13.0, 12.3 or the 12.2 release, depending on your requirement. Clicking on the 13.0 or the current release, you will see some brief information and advice on the disk images available. And that in the FreeBSD 13 section, there are many different supported platforms from the expected AMD 64 to the more specialized RISC-V. You can choose ISO, virtual machine images, SD card images for machines such as the Raspberry Pi, and importantly, documentation, as we saw earlier, which is part of the complete OS itself. For this video, we will be selecting the AMD64 architecture and installing it to another computer. If you are installing to a virtual machine, choose the image that best suits you or the ISO file that can be used with VirtualBox. We will select the IMG file, the image file, which can be written to an SD card or USB stick. If you require the full suite of software that can be installed without an internet connection, this would require the larger DVD file with DVD in the name. The other choices are the CD-ROM sized images, which are labeled disk one. These are of a similar build to the SD card or USB images, uh, which is a light install that contains the bare minimum in terms of packages and assumes you have a working internet connection. So we'll select the AMD64 memstick file as we are writing to a USB storage device and it's optimized for that, which will bring up the save dialog. Save to the location you want and remember this location as you will need it later when we begin the writing to USB process. Once the download has been completed, change to the folder where it was downloaded or find the folder through the dialog in your app of choice. For Windows users, you can write the image file to the USB stick using Belena Etcher, Win32 Disk Imager or Rufus. For Unix-like operating systems, you can use the DD or Disk Dupe utility to do the work using the syntax you can see on the screen. There are subtle differences between each OS and how to format the command. Mac users can also use Berlin Etcher. In this particular case, we are using a FreeBSD machine to do the writing, so we will be using the FreeBSD command format. Once that is done, remove the USB stick and put it in the computer you want to install on. Making sure we can boot from the USB stick, we'll reboot the machine. The speed of the install really does depend on the speed of your hardware, in particular the USB stick, and whether it's USB 1, USB 2, or USB 3. You may experience USB 1 speeds if there's a problem with your virtual box, or USB 2 speeds 
if you've got an older computer like I'm using for the test machine, which is an Optiflex 780. On machines with a USB 3 Plus, it will be a quicker experience. A few moments later, you will be greeted with a standard FreeBSD boot menu and a whole lot of menu options. Not to worry, once you learn what these do, because it doesn't change very often, you'll be good to go. 1. Boot into the system normally, which is the default behaviour. 2. Boot into a single user or maintenance mode. 3. Allows setting or unsetting of loader variables. 4. Restart the machine. 5. Enables selection of desired graphics device. So if you have a machine with both AMD or NVIDIA, you can choose which one. 6. Select kernel if there's more than one. 7. Change boot options for this boot session only. And 8. This option will appear if you're using a boot environment manager such as BEADM. Pressing enter will boot into the multi-user mode, which happens to be the default. You won't really need to worry about the other options unless your hardware or system requires intervention either pre or post install. During the boot process, you will see lots of text scrolling up the screen. This is normal and other operating systems do this as well, but it's often hidden behind splash screens or other graphics. The first menu you will see is the welcome screen, where you will be asked if you want to begin the installation or use the live CD. The latter is not what you may think it is in the traditional sense of live CD. There is no GUI or desktop. Think of it as a rescue option that will take you to a command line environment. To start the install process, press enter or return depending on what your keyboard shows. We will then be presented with a key map screen. At the top is the option to continue with the default, which is the US keyboard map. And straight underneath is the testing option, just to make sure you've selected the correct key map. In our case, because we're in the United Kingdom, we will have to scroll down. Of course, you choose your own depending on where you are. When you have selected your option, testing is a good idea, although not essential. If you're happy, then select the continue option. Next, we need to set the host name. You can choose an appropriate name here. I tend to call the test machine, well, test. I have a few machines here, so really it's for my benefit. Next is the distribution selection screen, but it isn't the same as a Linux distribution selection. No, this is where we can choose what should be installed into our system. Note that this isn't the user land application, such as LibreOffice, etc., but debugging files, 32-bit libraries and source trees, etc. Because we're installing a desktop oriented FreeBSD-based system, we can unselect the debugging options and keep the 32-bit compatibility libraries just in case we need them down the road. We don't need the ports tree unless we will be installing from ports rather than pre-compiled packages. Next is partitioning. This next bit is down to personal choice, I suppose. If you want total control, then you could and should manually partition your drive. There are tutorials out there that suggest that this should be the way it should be done. I, I disagree. The, the guided options are as suggested by FreeBSD is perfectly okay. And if you choose root on ZFS, the suggested partitioning scheme is pretty good. The options here are auto ZFS, auto UFS, manual and shell. The first two determine the file system choice, ZFS being relatively new and UFS is extremely stable and well developed. I used to be a great UFS fan, and I still am, but I've shifted towards ZFS for the backup features you get with it, especially the boot environment managers. I find them to be invaluable. The final two options are a manual partitioning option using a menu and a shell option to partition the system by hand if you so desire. Because we selected guided root on ZFS, we are presented with a ZFS configuration menu, much of which we can leave as default. But that's not to say we should. If there's any options you would like to change, now is the time to do so. Top of the menu is the proceed with installation. Next is the pool type or disk menu, which will allow us to define which disks to use in the pool and which disks are present and should be used. Next is rescan devices and disks info to get the information on any devices already attached to the system. Pool name allows you to customize the Z pool name. You can leave this as default if you want. Next, force care sectors. This can be toggled on or off, but it's advised to leave it on as it aligns partitions to the 4K sector of the hard drive in new and larger hard drives. The next option asks whether we want to encrypt the disks and it would be using Geli to encrypt the data. Very useful indeed and handy if using the laptop with FreeBSD and ZFS. Down the list and you'll see a partition scheme option. It's suggested to leave it as a default, which is GPT. Swap is the next option to configure. In the default configuration here, it is only two gigabytes, which is not that much in the scheme of things. You can mirror the swap if you want for redundancy. Following that is the option to encrypt your swap. Again, it's a personal choice, but one that is included for added security. Going back up to the pool 
uh, type disk entry. Uh, pressing enter will take us to the virtual device type config menu where we can set the type of ZFS system we want. You can set the stripe for a single hard drive with no redundancy. You can still get the benefits of ZFS but just not the mirroring and this is fine for most desktop systems that will perhaps only have one hard drive. Then there is mirror where two or more disks can be connected. It provides the best performance but the least storage uh, as essentially you only have access to one drive's capacity. So two one terabyte drives will be seen as just one terabyte rather than two terabytes. I think that these two options are the best for a workstation or desktop. The rest are pretty much server beneficial and specialized to a certain extent. So selecting Stripe because there is only one single hard drive in the test machine takes us to the select the drive menu where the hard drive is listed at the top of the, and the USB from which we are booting is at the bottom. For FreeBSD, most internal drives are labeled ADA0, ADA01, ADA02, etc. And external or USB storage devices are DA0 or DA1 or DA2, etc. So we need to select ADA0 to install the FreeBSD OS. On selecting our choice, we have returned to the previous menu and we just need to select Proceed. Before the actual install begins, we are presented with what a last chance to back out of sorts. It will look scary, but really it's there to make sure that you know that the drive will be wiped and written over. And we are off. We'll fast forward this. The next phase involves some input in order to finalize the install. First is the request for an admin or root password, which will allow the installation of software and other system-wide tasks. You will need to remember this and not give it out to other users if you are not the only user of the system. You won't see any asterisks or other signs that you are typing, so you will have to be careful. And this is a good thing in general, as it makes it hard for someone to see how many characters are in your password and possibly guess it. But it also makes it hard just in case you forget what you've typed, or indeed if you haven't typed enough. And this is where the retype your password comes in. If you are sure you have typed it incorrect but made a small error, typing the password as it should be in the second line will flag up that they don't match. Next is the network configuration. You may get different results here, different names for Ethernet devices, maybe some Wi-Fi devices. Select the one you want, in this case the built-in Ethernet, and press Enter. You will next need to configure IPv4 or IPv6. In this install it's IPv4, so we select Yes. And then, do we need to configure DHCP? Well, you can of course, and sometimes that's the easiest route. But for this test machine, I do prefer to go the manual way and select No, which will take us to the manual entry page for the IP address, etc. Put in the values you require, then select OK, then press Enter. Again, if you want to configure IPv6, you can. I don't, so it's a No. The next part is configuring the LAN and the DNS server address you want. All done for you if you chose DHCP, but here it's up to you. Put what's appropriate for your system in the LAN section and the address or addresses you want for the next two. Next is the time config. You can choose UTC or go for the more in-depth setup. Selecting No, we can see the time zone selector and a whole list of available time zones to choose from. Select the region you want, in this case Europe. We can choose another region or country if listed and we'll select United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. Confirming the abbreviated time zone, we move on to setting the time and date. And if it all looks correct, you can select skip. Or if there is a problem here, then this is the chance to set it. Moving on, we are now presented with the system configuration menu. And we can choose which services we will have running at boot time. The services are a personal choice and you may need some and other not so much. You can select or unselect these later if you change your mind. You can choose local unbound, a local caching server, SSHD, the secure shell daemon, if you want to get into the machine remotely, mouse D for PS2 connected mice, not really needed if you have a USB mouse, but it can be enabled if you want. Then there is NTP date and NTPD, both used to sync your machine to a time server, so you have the correct time. Then we have power D, which can be used to adjust the CPU frequency, not so much aimed at desktop users, but laptop users will find it very handy. Then finally, there is dump dev, which will place kernel crash dumps in the var crash folder. Something needed for servers and developers, but perhaps not so much for desktop usage. When you are happy with your selection, then select OK at the bottom of the list. Next, we have the hardening list. And for a desktop system, you can select all these options. 
Like the last menu, if you are running a server or development machine, then maybe you might want to keep some things like hid underscore jails and disable DD trace enabled. It all depends. Now, perhaps the most essential menus, adding users or users to your desktop system. No users is, makes not for a useful desktop system. So we need to add some and we need to select yes here. Abruptly, the design of the screen changes uh, to something which I wish was more of a uniform design like the earlier cursor style, but it does the job and it sets the look you will get when the system finally installs. First, add a username. It can be a shortened version of your own name or nickname. I use lowercase, but you don't have to. Just remember what you put as you won't be able to log in if you forget it. Then enter your full name. And as you can see, use a different case arrangement for your username. Next is user ID. We can leave this as default and it would give you the first user added as 1001. Then there is login group. Again, we can leave it as default and it incorporates the username so it makes sense. Next, we are invited to add the user to some other groups. And here we normally add wheel, operator and video. Login class can be left at default and shell can be set to your own choice. It depends on what you prefer. I personally like the plain born shell. Home directory can be left as default as well, as can home directory permissions. The default yes for password based authentication is advised, as is no for using an empty password. You don't want a random password, you might forget it. Selecting no will prompt you to enter a password for your user. And again, like the root password entry, it's important that you enter it correctly as you won't see any input on the screen. The next question is, do you want to lock out the account after creation? Uh, no to that, which is then followed by a summary of the entries you have made so far. If you are happy with that, then type yes. Otherwise type no, and we will start the process of adding a user again. If we are happy with the details, then typing yes will bring up that the user has been created. And would we like to add another user? If we do, type yes. If not, then type no. Now we're on the second to final menu, and this is an opportunity to change anything we have entered so far. If all is good, then select exit, which will then apply the configuration and exit the installer. Now, the all but one final menu is a confirmation that the install has been completed. And it asks you, would you like to make any modifications to the terminal by hand? You can drop to a shell if you do, otherwise you can select no, which will take you to the final screen. Here you can choose to reboot and then quickly remove the USB stick um, or change the BIOS so it doesn't boot from USB. Or you could choose the live CD option, which will allow you to enter some commands like shutdown, hyphen P now, and then you can remove the USB stick at your leisure. Okay, we'll choose reboot and allow the machine and OS to do their thing. I'll put a red square in the middle of the screen to say when you should remove your USB if you still have it in. Be quick though. So here we are, rebooting, and the first thing you will see when the initial boot has finished is the FreeBSD boot menu screen we first started with when we began the install. Pressing enter will begin the boot, and the usual text will fly up the screen. After a little while, we are presented with the login prompt. It may look sparse, and there aren't any thrills when you uh, first install FreeBSD, that's for sure, but that's part of the greatness about it. Enter the name of the user we created earlier and the password you hopefully remembered. And that's it. It may not be snazzy, it may not have the fancy graphics of other operating systems, but it is ours to create and to mold into something that's unique to us and we will start that process in the next video. Anyway, thanks for watching, and I'll catch you next time. This and every other video on my channel has been made using FreeBSD and open source software.